with all of the leaders that make this India today what it is. Then we want to uh, tweet the grandparents, the parent generation, and then all the little ones that are here. It can be them, it can be this little spider up there, or the gecko over there, or everything that's around us. Same one that sold in 1976. You know, just sold three years ago, we gave you a worldwide sell. And the thing that sell was Malama Humua, we'll just take care of the earth. So as it was sailing around the world, it was exploring, sharing how we take care of the earth, and learning from other people too. So this voyage canoe still exists today. In fact, every island has a voyage canoe now. We have a fleet of voyage canoes. So we came to Hawaii in, in the year zero, and the way we educated our people, the way we live, we were very happy, we were very healthy, and we had everything we needed. Everything we made was a work of art. We didn't make art to put it on the wall, but everything we made, our clothes, everything we needed was very beautiful, was a work of art. And we, we are lucky because our islands have a lot of water, we can grow food the whole year, and when, the, when Captain Cook, the first English white person came in 1778, there was one million of us in Hawaii. Then we have 100 years of change, big change, horrible change. Within 100 years, we are only 40,000. So one million to 40,000. So massive depopulation because of the diseases, the sickness that comes, venereal disease, leprosy, cholera, uh, 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 whooping cough, all these, all these diseases, so, so we, we died, many, many of us died. And then um, we also have a change because the missionaries, the American missionaries come in 1820 and they think that we are a link between humans and animals. They look at us as a, are they not perhaps a link between man and the fruit? They want if we can be human. And so they, they treat us like less than, you know, everything Hawaiian is not good anymore. But they introduce the ability to read and write. And so within a hundred years, we become among the most literate nations in the world. We have the same literacy as Europe, 
Belgium, Holland, Germany, France, that almost all of our people can read. Um, but we lose many other things. We lose our health, we lose our land. There's a private land ownership. Before that, only the gods own the land, and we take care of it. We are only the servants of the land. We don't own the land. Then they make private land ownership so that they can get the land, and we end up with no land. Um, and so many, many changes in the first hundred years. Then we have a terrorist attack. The Americans come and they take away the, our queen. This is our queen right here. Um, she, her name is Lili Uokalani. And in 1893, the Mer American military overthrows our queen. And she steps down because she doesn't want any more Hawaiians to die because we're already 96 percent of the population died within a hundred years. And so she steps down and from then on we have been occupied by the United States. We are an occupied nation, an occupied territory, like Palestine, for example. And um, the Americans outlaw our language. So now when in the school, when the children speak Hawaii, our, our grandparents, when they speak Hawaii, they get beaten. And they, they are told, you are stupid. And when they are in a hostel, they, they are not allowed to go home on vacation, and they can only eat bread and water if they speak the language. So the language is outlawed. So from one generation to the next, we lose our language. So our grandparents, they could still speak Hawaiian. Our parents cannot speak Hawaiian at all. So everything Hawaiian, you know, first, uh, uh, health, land, sovereignty, uh, now language, and home, right? After that we have no home. And we think we are stupid because everybody says we are stupid. And everything Hawaii is less. So in that, uh, any kind of education, if it is anything Hawaiian, it is only for the dumb children, for the special education children. And all the smart children all want to learn how to do Western education, American education. And then in 1976, this canoe sails to Tahiti, and we know, wow, our ancestors were smart because they didn't need a map, they didn't need a compass, they needed nothing. And then we also learned from Gandhi, we learned from the Native American movement, we learned from the American Indian movement, and we start our own movement. We, the bomb of the American military takes one of our islands, The island of Kaho'olawe, right here, they bomb it. They use it as target time practice. In the Second World War, they kick out everybody. And from the Second World War until 1990, they use it as target practice to, blow, to bomb it up, to practice how to shoot their guns. And so we occupy the island. We go to the island, we swim, we, we, we go on the boat, and we jump in, we swim to the island. And from 1976 until 1990, we protest, we go to the island, and we start to do ancient uh, prayers again for water because they destroyed the island, for peace because we need to have peace. We do our ancient ceremonies again, which start now. So November to January, we pray for peace, we pray for fertility, we pray for happiness for the people uh, and the land. Um, and so we start doing that again. And then finally in 1990, the bombing stops. Um, so when we grew up, I was born in 1960, he was born in 1959, everything Hawaiian is less. People are ashamed to be Hawaiian. If you look white like me, uh, I have a Hawaiian last name, but then you try not to be Hawaiian because it's not good to be Hawaiian. Uh, but then 1976, slowly we feel good again, slowly, very slowly, about being Hawaiian because we know our ancestors are smart and because we start to fight against the Americans <coughs> and what they're doing to our land and the developers that come in. In one place on the island of Maui, they dug out 2,000 skeletons to build a hotel. You know, and we said, no, we protest because you don't want to be in a hotel that's that we used to be a graveyard and all the people came out. So they had to put all the people back in. 
So we were active as grassroots activists. And then I started teaching in 1985, and, for, and I taught Hawaiian language. When I went to the university to try and learn Hawaiian language, they said, you're stupid. The language is dead, you're wasting your time, you will never get a job. But I said, if I don't know my language, how can I be Hawaiian? Because my mother is German, and I know German, and that's the only way I can be German. I can say, I'm German, but I don't know how to talk German. The Germans go, ah, no way you're German, right? You're going to be German if you don't speak German. So I had to be, if I want to be Hawaiian, I have to know my language too. So uh, uh, there was maybe four or five of us who went back to the university to learn Hawaiian. And then we, we started to teach Hawaiian in the schools. I was one of the first teachers to teach Hawaiian in the schools. And the moment I went in there, I couldn't teach the way I was taught at the university. And I wasn't, couldn't talk the way I was taught in teachers' college because the Hawaiian children, they didn't like that. It was boring. So we sang, we played music, we played games, we had fun together, and we still learned. So I knew I had to make changes. And the kids liked my class, and they got really good grades, and we, did, we set high standards. They had to um, write, write or draw or uh, make, make uh, drama and all that. And they went to competitions to do chants, and they were very successful. But the people said, oh yeah, that, that's Hawaiian, it's, it's easy, right? French and Japanese is hard, Hawaiian is easy. <laughs> you know, every language is hard or easy. Like, you know. But that, that was the idea. And so I, and then I looked at the grades of my students every time. Hawaiian A, science F, math D, English F. So very bad grades in all the other classes, only my class they got good grades. And then I said, I can't do this anymore, right? Uh, the children are smart. The children are not the problem. How come they're getting these and Fs? So then, um, in the meantime, on our island, we have a volcano goddess. Oops. She, she, her name is Pele, and the name of the lava is also Pele. So I'll pass this around. We have snow on our island, and there's a goddess, her name is Poliahu. And Poliahu and Pele, they don't like each other. They have the same boyfriend, and since then they fight because of the boyfriend. So, so uh, we have this, 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 uh, you can, uh, you can put it, not this uh, So, the people came, they wanted to steal the steam of Pele. They wanted to drill into her, and to us, it was like raping her. It's like raping Pele and taking out her blood. And we said, no, we, we don't, we're not gonna allow that. So we got arrested, and that night, we, there was thousands of people by the fence that wanted to go and stop. But 140 of us went across and we got arrested, and the others stayed behind. And that evening we said, what would happen if 500 went across the fence? If a thousand went across the fence, then the game changes, right? Then the strategy has to change. So then we said, how can we get more people to do what we're doing? And we said, we're going to have to start with the children. It has to be the children. And so we went into our valley. Uh, we have a beautiful valley, no electricity, a big stream. And we started to take the children for one month, one moon cycle. We had 24 ch children from big all the way to uh, old, uh, young people, older people, elders. We all stayed in this valley for one month and we lived off the land. We picked the mangoes and we go fishing and we helped the farmer and then the farmer gives us food and we just kind of organically did what we had to do to survive and at the end we needed to show the parents that the children learn something. And we had boys, when they, when they first came, you talk to them and be like this. They, they don't want to look at you, they're ashamed, they're insecure. Then we, when we work, the men always take off their shirt. We tell them, take off their shirt. Go, oh, no, 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 because they're uh, chubby. <laughs> they don't want to take off their shirt. So by the end, they stand, they only have a loin cloth, like a little piece, no shirt, only loyal. They stand proud like this and they're chanting. 
in one month. Big difference. And the parents are crying because they can't even recognize their own son. He's so handsome now, and he's so proud, and he's so strong, and he can chat in Hawaii. Before that, they couldn't say anything in Hawaii. Maybe aloha, you know, one, two, three words, but they couldn't chat. Now they can chat. They, they learn more Hawaiian language in one month than I could teach them in an entire year in the school. You know, 45 minutes, 45 minutes, blah, blah, blah. It, This was way better because we lived together. It all made sense. It was things that they needed. And so we were so happy with the outcome. You know, one month and whole miracles happened. But people said, yeah, because you're only doing Hawaiian things, you know, and, they, and you're having fun. And, and so we said, okay, we're going to start a school within a school. So we were teaching at a school, and we went to the principal and we said, can we have 100 students, 9th to 12th grade, and we're going to take them for all their classes. Because science, F, math, F, now we have them, now we can teach them science, we can teach them math, we can teach them language, arts, history, etc. So we took the, the children, and in the first year, we had a 59% decrease in absences. These children were absent 100 days out of the year. They never went to school. But when we started our school within the school, it was called the Hawaiian Academy, they came every day. They tell the parents, hurry up, hurry up, we gotta get to school. And the parents go, who is this kid? You know, they, they don't understand. The big criticism we had was, these children are not learning. And we said, why? They said, well, when we go by your room, you're always laughing. <laughs> too much laughing. That was our big problem. We had too much fun. And so, within a very short time, um, we saw how the students would change. It was called the Hawaiian Academy. And we thought with the word academy, it would sound like, you know, Yale, Harvard, or you know, it would sound rigorous. But as soon as we put the word Hawaiian in front of it, everybody said, oh, is this for the dumb students? Is this for the dropouts? So we put academically rigorous on every paper, everywhere we put academic. We weren't that academically rigorous, but we put it on all the papers for, you know, just that's what we're working towards. And we, was, we had a thousand people visited us in the first four, four years that we had the academy. But not one teacher from our school. Not one person that worked at the school visited us. But a thousand people from around the world came to see what we were doing. And we did not get the support of the school. We thought we could make this and then other places where we have many Hawaiians, they can do it too. So then we went to the government and we changed the law to allow for charter schools. And a charter school is a kind of independent school. It's still public, but it's independent. It doesn't have to follow all the rules. So we became the first Hawaiian charter school. And at that time, our children, our baby was in kindergarten, and our older daughter was in second grade. So we didn't unschool just our two children. We unschooled 120 children. So we had 60 and 60, two projects. From kindergarten to 12th grade, they were together. Because our, our, in our way, in our families, we all learned together. Not first grade, second grade, third grade. That's not our way. We have the younger one has to listen to the older one. The older one is responsible for the younger one. That's how we learn. And so we had 60 and 60. And people said, oh, you cannot have a kindergarten girl with a 12th grade boy, right? That's dangerous. And these were, you know, with yellow hair and a nose ring and pierced nipple and whatever, those kind of boys. And, and they said, oh, no, we cannot do that. And the boys were so gentle with the little girls because the little girls looked at them and they just said, oh, you are the greatest, you know. And nobody had ever looked at the boys that way. You know, all the boys would be, oh, he's a loser, or he's a criminal, or he's dangerous, you know, that, because that's what they looked like. Um, but the little girls, they just loved them so much that the boys became strong and they felt good and we had never had any problems. The other thing is we had no facilities. The state didn't give us anything for a house. So we had 
um, a little um, tents and shipping containers and a three bedroom house, a little tiny house, like Amici's house, that, that had little three rooms, that's it, small house. That was the whole campus. Um, and so only 60 kids could stay there. The other 60, we said, hmm, where can we take them? <laughs> oh, there's a beach down there. So, and in, on the beach, it was very hot. They had a little shelter, uh, a little house shelter that was for everybody. Um, but you couldn't write because the paper would fly away. There's a lot of wind down there. So they had to do everything hands on um, and go out and learn from the land. So one week 60 in the campus, one week 60 in the ocean, and then the next week we switch around. And that was how we, how we started out because we had no room, no facilities. And the kids learned so much. Our old children, we watched our old children learning and people said, yeah, but I don't think they can go to college. You know, this is only for if you just want to work that land and, and you know, this is not so good. Um, our two daughters both graduated from college, so it, it was not about that. And um, the things that the students learned was aloha to, to, to share with one another. And so um, we, we needed to make a building. So we got land and we went to the community and we asked the elders, what kind of building do you want? And then what kind of place? And the place was not just a school, but it was for the whole community. And they said we wanted to be Hawaiian, we wanted to reflect the land where we live, and we wanted to take care of the land. And taking care of the land is our Hawaiian way, Aloha Aina. Aloha means love, Aina means land, love the land. And so we built a building using these ancient values, ancient traditions, and it became the first green, green building, education green building in all of Hawaii. And in America they have a, a stamp, it's called LEED, L-E-E-D. It's like green building technology, and they have bronze, silver, gold, platinum. And they said, oh, you should apply because you're a green building. We said, well, maybe we can get gold. But we got platinum because we listened to the elders. <coughs> so we learned to understand in education, ancient is modern. And in the meantime, I was getting my PhD in indigenous education. I wanted to be get it in indigenous education, and they said, there's no such field. And I said, well, I'm indigenous and I'm an educator. And they said, so write a paper and prove that there is a field. So I wrote a paper, proved that there's a field. So in the end, I became the first person to get a PhD in indigenous education. Today, that this was in 1996, so I don't know. Today, everybody knows there is such a field. But when I wrote my paper, it was called Kanuoka Aina, which means natives of the land or plants of the land which is the name of our school, and natives of the land from generations back is the other meaning. Plants of the land is the same as natives of the land from generations back, because we are like the plants of the land. And then it was called a pedagogy of liberation, because I wanted to you know, liberate ourselves from America uh, and everything. And then when I asked the students, what is different about this school? How come you come to school every day now and before you never used to come to school. They said, because somebody cares about me. This is the first place, first school that I feel loved. The boy said, this is the first time a man has told me I love you. Because Akhonale, every day he tells them I love you. And not just he tells them I love you, he shows them I love you. And that, and so after the children, Year number one, year number two, year number three, they say aloha. I mean, from the little ones all the way up to the others. What is different? Caring, compassion, love, aloha. That's what they told us over and over. So then I had to say, okay, forget liberation. Scratch liberation because it's not about them. It's about aloha. And we, when you turn around and you see Dalai Lama, for me, it's the same thing. It's my pedagogy is very simple. My pedagogy is aloha. So we created a pedagogy of aloha. 
We didn't only start our school, we helped 11 other schools on three different islands so that we could show that this worked everywhere, not just where we are, not just because of us. Because it's not us, it, it is, it's way, 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 way bigger than us. So all of those schools believe in education with aloha. Education with aloha. Ea. And ea in Hawaii means swaraj. It means sovereignty and independence. And we did not that we did not figure that out. You know, it was not us. It happened that way. Yeah, it happened that way. And so this was very very um, exciting. So um, in 2010, I left the school, and because we found out that even when they graduate, they need two more years of hand holding. They need two more years of support. So now we're starting Ea Ecoversity. And it's for youth to transition them to become mature adults. And we were over where we were and we saw how maturity is. Those are the kind of things, you know, where, where they know how to give, where they know how to interact with each other, where they know how to forgive, right? Where they know how to serve. We want to teach them that part beyond high school, still two more years, or maybe three, you know, it depends on the kids. But that's my next project, and our AI University, we're planning to start in 2020. So we've been part of the Ecoversity movement with Manish um, Jai? Jai? Manish Jai? Yeah. Uh, Manish Jai. And we were in Portugal in 2015, and then in, in, in Costa Rica in 2017, and then this year, we met uh, at, at Swaraj University in Udaipur, and uh, Sumi was there, and you two were there. And then, <laughs> the divine led us right here, which is the whole crowd. Uh, because, it, it, you know, we don't know how it happened, we don't know how we got here, but we are here, and we are very, very thankful. So that's our story. Uh, in, in the short version, <laughs> uh, you want to have a another <laughs> Then, if you have any question, uh, oh, one more thing we, we do with technology. Yeah, when in 1993, the Department of Education said integrate technology into your curriculum. Well, if you were a French teacher, you go and you order something. Spanish you order, but everybody could order. We Hawaii, <laughs> there was nothing, right? So we said, well, if the students cannot be consumers of technology, because there is nothing, they need to become creators. So since then, we have been working on having our students create. They create multimedia CD-ROM, they create uh, advertisements, they create videos, and they create books. As, uh, and all about us, right? Because right now we have other people creating about us, and it's not even true what they say about us. You know, like, uh, yeah. Yeah. So we need to become the creators of information about us. So our students have been creating information. So this last, uh, we got money from the universities for publications, and so our students, uh, they, they graduated already, they made these three books. And I pass it around. And the way we do it is, and these are coloring books about taking care of the ocean, oh, oh, taking care of the forest, sorry, taking care of the ocean, and taking care of the street. And because we want to teach Hawaiian, we do it like this is in English, and if you turn it around, then it's in Hawaiian. So each, if a kid knows Hawaiian, they read, they say, this is the front. And they read it this way. If you read English better, then you say this is the front, and you read it this way. So I'll pass those on. So these were um, one of them is our daughter, and the other one is a friend. They graduated together in 2013, and when we heard about the grant, they said we want to do a coloring book for the children. So when we went to Swaraj, we just got those and we, we printed it because it only costs one dollar in Udaipur to print. In, a, in, a, in Hawaii, twenty dollars. So we, we printed and we printed two hundred. We gave away hundred and thirty, 
and we're taking the other ones home with us. Our suitcases are going to be very heavy, but you know that that way we share. Everybody, you know, it shares. Yes, that's the one more thing. Okay, if you have any questions, yes. then we can answer questions. Without any mic stones, you just work on the kids and their upbringing. I mean, how does your school work? We we look at it all. We look, everything's tentative. So, in other words, there's a syllabus, but it's not a syllabus. So if a child comes in the morning and says, Uncle, I had this dream, it's about this, we talk about the dream. We don't, we don't, we don't, we don't just, we don't have a plan to talk about um, the economics of the United States and how to fix native Hawaiian people. Let's put to the side. But that's more important to talk about right now. So we have a plan, but we don't follow it if the universe tells us to do something else. It's, yeah. it's more for the system. They ask you to plan. Oh, yeah, I have a plan. Yeah. For the state government, for the government, yeah? Yeah. But then that's not a plan. <laughs> and it's, it's, okay. it's a con job, yeah. whatever you want to call it. Yeah. It's but a the or original plan when I was there was 50% safety, 50% in, in the school, 50% in the environment. And when they go in the environment, they do real projects. So, for example, one time a stream was taken, the water was taken away from the stream, and then the sugar company closed, and then the water was returned. And then for six, eight, eight years, almost eleven years, uh, they they went out every other week from Monday to Thursday. They stay in the valley and they look what happens to the stream. They look at what happens to the animals, and there were biologists came from the university, you know, all those kind of things. But the children stayed out there for all those years and they learned about the stream. When we left our school, the school within the school, the science teacher said, Oh, I feel so sorry for you. Your children will never do any real science. And I said, Why? He said, Because you have no science lab. You don't have no beaker and pumps and burner and blah, blah, blah. Our students won science competitions in the whole state every year because they did real science, right? And what they found out was important, it mattered. It was, it no, even the scientists didn't know the answer. They learned the answer together with the student. They used high-tech equipment to look at the fertility and the, the velocity of the stream and, and the diseases of the fish, like real, real science, real authentic science. So we have projects that are real. Authentic, they make a difference. They make a difference in the community, and the and the students they go to the board of water supply and they say, hey, we found out when you return a hundred percent of the water, the natives will thrive. And so we have a company now, a social enterprise. It's called Ku Akanaka. So our um, website, if you guys want to look at it, is www.kuakanaka.com. I'll I'll give it to you. And then. It needs to stand as a Hawaiian. But the byline is when natives thrive, everyone benefits. Right? And that's native plants, native animals, native people, native land. When that thrives, everyone benefits. So we have we have project-based learning, uh, but we go with the flow. Okay? <laughs> yeah. So project-based, place-based, research-based. Yeah. And our projects take place on our part of the island. Because you know, even though I care about my own nation, this is my home. And this, but even though even though it's my island, it's a whole other place down here. So what I do up here is totally different from what they do down there. So we need to think locally before we think as a nation. We got to think first as a nation before we think globally. And our island here is totally different than this island. So whatever we do in this island, we would take just show them what we do. But it's up to them whether they're going to take care of their place or not. That's their responsibility. We're just here to share. Yeah. You're gonna take on the kuleana cool responsibility, good. If not, sad. I'll come. I'll come. So we kind of put in that it's just a rock on your shoulder. You need to carry that rock. You need to be your bigger responsibility. Show them what you need to be doing. The students love it. And basically, um, what ends up happening is that um, I just sit on the side and let them teach. So the students, so we're in an environment where we're all teachers, we're all learners. Yeah. So we all learn together. You know, um, for these scientists and all too, and then you're bringing the curriculum stuff to help them with that, the writing papers, the, the basic, the logistics stuff. And then uh, when it's time to present, 
I see that money doing now. I just listen. So the students become the teachers. So they go to symposiums. Um, the first time they actually went to a, a symposium, it was an international um, symposium on water studies. Some of the best scientists in the world that do water stream biology come to this conference. And, uh, and some of the scientists were mad because they only got 15 minutes to talk. Our students had 45 minutes to talk. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but when the keynote speaker came up, which was like, and, and, and it's also interesting that a lot of these professors that were mad were old professors, Ivory Tower professors, people who in academia has been in this, this field for 30, 40 years. But when the keynote speaker came up to speak, he was a younger professor, a young man. And basically when he got up, all he told the audience was, I want everybody to stand up and applaud these students. And these are middle school students now, grades six through eight. These weren't even high school students, yeah? So I want everybody to stand up and applaud these students. And if you want to talk to me, I'll be standing in the corner over here. And he just walked off the stage. He didn't even want to Because the students pretty much covered what he was going to cover, what, the, what he was going to say. But he, but he acknowledged their presence. He acknowledged what they had to say. He also acknowledged that they taught everybody today. And if you want to talk to me, I'll be over here in the corner. And so he, he even, but I'll go and went to the corner, not even in front of everybody else. So that was a big, uh, big uh, plus for the students. So our magic formula, <laughs> uh, formula, relations, right? Aloha, love, care. That's number one, relations. So I'm not Dr. Kahakalao and Eddie uh, Kuhn. I was the principal, but I didn't, I'm Mr. Mrs. Principal, I'm Eddie, Eddie Kuhn. And I can hug them, I can love them, I can pull their ear if they don't listen. I can scold them with aloha. One little kid, he came, he was in kindergarten, the most suspended, suspended in kindergarten, the most suspended. And then he came to our school. And then he ran, he was coming around the corner and he ran right into Uncle Nale. And you're not supposed to run on campus. And then I go, hey, why are you running? He goes, oh, I have to go to the office and see Eddie Koo. And the principal now, right? And, and he was happy. Yeah, and he was smiling. Him. Yeah. And then what did you say? I said, that's a good thing? He says, of course. Over here, I get scolding with aloha. You know, so mm -hmm. And scolding. Scolds me with, with aloha. aloha. <laughs> I get so, scolding with love. You know, yeah. so. so even if you have to tell them, you still do it with aloha. So number one, the new R's. You know, really write everything. We threw that out. We have new R's. First R, <laughs> relations. There are relations, number one. Number one, if you don't have that, don't worry about the other ones. It's not going to work. Right? That's how we feel, right? Relations is number one. Number two, relevance. It has to be real. It has to make sense. So watching the fish and understanding why you have to do that, because if you, if you find out it's good, then more water can be returned. You know, It has to make sense and be relevant. Um, it has to relate to who they are. We don't start with U.S. history because the U.S. is very far away. We start with Hawaii history. We don't start with the polar bears or, you know, we start with, with the animals that live in Hawaii, right? So we don't start with Brahms and Beethoven. We start with Hawaiian musicians and Hawaiian music, right? So we start everything, every subject starts in Hawaii and then we go out. You know, it's not about not learning about them, but it's you start with what makes sense. You start with the things that the students know already and not what they don't know, right? So we always start with what they know. So relations first, relevance number two, number three, responsibility. Because now that you know, then you need to serve. You need to take care, right? You have a responsibility to the land, you have a responsibility to the people, you have a responsibility to the spiritual world. So that's the next part. Because just because knowing and not doing anything about it, waste of time, right? But once you know, then you have to do something about it. Then you have to be responsible to take care of the land, to take care of the ocean, to take care of the forest, to take care of the streams. That's your responsibility. So. Relations plus relevance plus responsibility equals rigor. Rigor, rigor, the academic part, comes automatic. The, the Western government, they always want to start, start with rigor, right? Snake, 
how rigorous is it? Well, it's not going to be rigorous if you don't have relation, relevance, and responsibility. And then you don't have to worry about this part. It's going to come. If it makes sense to the, if they know you love them, if it makes sense to them, if they understand their responsibility, like all these, you know, when we look everywhere here, we see people that understand their responsibility to make a better world, right? Every single thing we look, that all the pictures we looked at where we were today, every one of those people understands their responsibility and does something about it, right? And then the rest is my antidotes automatic, automatic, right? It, it's going to happen. We don't have to worry. But when we, it's, so when we instruct, we instruct according to the instruction. So it has cannot be curriculum instruction assessment. It has to be instruction first. Instruction with aloha, with love, right? We, we do relations. Instruction based on our values, which is aloha, kindness, generosity, caring, humility, uh, gratitude, those are all our values, and I know they're your values too, right? This is not just how I know. That's it. All when you think about it, these are our values. So our, our, the way we do instruction is based on our values. Our curriculum is based on our knowledge, on our ways, on our land first, and then you go out. And then the assessment is the way that our ancestors assess for thousands of years and that is performance-based assessment to an authentic audience. So when you go to Harvard now or Yale and you ask them, what is the best assessment? <laughs> performance-based assessment to an authentic audience. We call it Oike, Oike, and we have been doing it for thousands of years. It's what Lale said, the children at the end of the year, from kindergarten to 12th grade, they have to make a big, Pula drama, dance, uh, chant, skits about responsibility. So when that canoe sailed around the world, the theme for our school was the same as for the canoe. Mala Mahonua, take care of the of the earth. And each from kindergarten to twelfth grade, they learned different things about taking care of the earth. And at the end of the school year, they made a big show, a big uh, drama. Uh, performance and they first they invited in the morning on Friday other schools other children from other schools to teach them about how to take care of the earth then in the evening it was for the families and we charged maybe one dollar to come in and then the next evening it was for anybody for the community and then we charged maybe ten dollars because that's our fundraiser for the year and that they have to make their own clothes you know, they have to tie their clothes, they have to make all, they have, they have to do everything. They have to do the videotaping of the show, they have to make tickets, everything, the script, everything is the, the students make the whole production and they learn how to do that. And the older ones help the younger ones, how to put on their loyal cloth, you know, because they all wear traditional attire. And so this performance-based assessment is an ancient way but it is also a modern way. And we teach the community because that's the responsibility. When you know something, then they have to teach it to somebody else. And we have students, when they first come to us, they don't say one word. They just, mm. hello. <laughs> but they don't talk at all. And by the end, they chat or they, uh, this lady, uh, she did a, a long speech about being strong and la 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 la. The girl who didn't say anything the whole year, she did a on stage in a, in a full house, like 500 people kind of in a, a theater. She did the whole soliloquy of the Nikuo Kalani. We all, ah, <laughs> we couldn't believe it. You know, so much change in the children. Uh, and this is our number 18 year, we started in 2000. Uh, it's 2018 now, and I can give you guys uh, give you the website for the school, yes. and then you can look what the school is like, and then and Malay is still teaching at the school, and I, I left in 2010 when our uh, children was graduating, and then starting working on AI and conversity now for the next part, the next because we were still dependent, we still the school is still dependent on the government, and no matter how hard we work, they're not helping us. 
So it's, it's very, very hard financially. So people have to take loans and all this. But I want AI University to be fully self-sustaining, no money from the government that we need. If they give us some, that's fine. But it's not like we need their money, kind of. That's my plan. When you, when you say no money, you mean like state government? Uh, the state government, mostly in the US, uh, most of the money for education comes from the state. So it would be the state of Hawaii, which is not a real state. We yeah. call it the fake state. But in the, you know, because theoretically you're a part of the 50 states. Yeah, yeah. very theoretically. Yeah. 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 According, the you feel, you feel independent. Yeah, because we're not, according to our history, yeah. they didn't follow their own rules. After they overthrew the Queen, they made us a territory, mm -hmm. but we didn't have a vote, and we were supposed to have a vote. In fact, we have 20,000 signatures that say we're against it. So we know guarantee if there was a vote, it would have been no. And then House and Senate, two-thirds majority was supposed to agree. That didn't happen either. And then when we became a state in 1959, they took us off the list from the UN of, of colonized nations. We were on that list. So already internationally, they knew the territory was wrong. So we were on the list. And then the United States took us off the list and gave us only two choices, territory or state. But we were supposed to have our number three choice. If you're on the list, you're also supposed to have the choice of independence, and we were never given the choice. So internationally, we are not a state, but the United States is acting like we're a state. But more and more now, the truth is coming out. And so last year, we have a union for all the teachers, for all of the United States. And they made a, a declaration that they have to change the history books to put the truth in there. So it's slowly, slowly we get more, it's gonna take us a little longer still, but it's where how Gandhi started too, right? People didn't, didn't think that it could be done, right? People didn't believe it would happen. Uh, people thought, you know, whatever, and it took so long until it finally happened. So we have faith, we have, we have faith and we have hope <laughs> that it will happen before we die, hopefully, if not, our children will keep on fighting until it happens because it's, it's the only thing. We, we have a right to be free like every other people.